Good morning and welcome to our Massachusetts online divisional worship. We are so glad that you have chosen to join with us this morning in song, in word, and in prayer. Now, I don't know about you, but though my Christmas was absolutely beautiful, it felt a little different, which has kind of been the theme of this year. When we rang in the new year nearly 365 days ago, none of us could have anticipated what the days ahead would hold. I vividly remember sitting in my core building on March 12th, listening to the governor give a mandatory order about the closure of schools for the next two weeks. And then those two weeks turned to four, which eventually led to the rest of the school year. On that day in March, we never imagined that the months ahead would hold such difficulty. Political tension, civil unrest, racial division, heightened violence in our cities, widespread wildfire, and through all of that, a global pandemic that has claimed the lives of hundreds of thousands of loved ones. 2020 has been challenging, to say the least. But this morning, on this last Sunday, of what has been a year full of unknowns, I challenge us to put those difficulties behind us and to move forward with hope. Corey Ten Boom once said, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. We serve an ever faithful God who knows exactly what we are stepping into. And because of that, we choose to move forward in hope with faith alongside our God who never leaves us or forsakes us. We choose to look forward knowing that God is doing a new thing. So this morning as we begin our worship service, it is my prayer that the Lord would fill you with an overflowing sense of hope to be able to see and be a part of the new thing that God is going to do in our lives. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, this morning I pray for each individual under the sound of my voice. Father, I pray for the things or the, the situations that they feel weighted by this morning. I pray for the individuals who feel a sense of hopelessness over the events and the trials of this past year. I pray this morning, Lord, that you might remind us of the hope that can be found in you. Being a believer, being a follower of Jesus does not mean that we are exempt from difficulties or from heartache. Being a follower of Jesus does not mean that we will not experience anxiety or grief or, or pain. But it does mean that we have the ability to take our eyes off of the circumstances that seek to destroy us and to see your outstretched hand of abundance and provision. Father, this morning, might we choose to see the hope of your goodness and your glory through the smog of the sin that covers our world. We pray this in your matchless and in your holy name. Amen. Praise be to God, the Eternal One, for He has done the impossible. He carved a path through the pounding waves. He conquered chariots and horses, armies and warriors. He banished our enemies to the depths of the sea. Not that you need a reminder, but this is who he is. This is what he has done. And he's not finished yet. Forget all that, he says, for it's nothing compared to what I am about to do. Don't become a prisoner of the past. Don't waste your time basking in the glories of days gone by. Wake, Wake up, open, open your eyes, look, look closely. I'm about to do something new, he says. I'm bursting forth like the dawn. Don't you see it? This, this is, is what, what he speaks, speaks over you today. today. I've made a way through the wilderness. No longer will you wander in darkness and despair. New life has taken root in the barren wasteland where you once lived. Rivers gush forth and springs overflow. Come, Come and drink, be filled, filled and refreshed. In our work and in our families, I am doing a new thing. In our chaos and our stillness, I am doing a new thing. In our mind and understanding, I am doing a new thing. In our nation and our world, I am doing a new thing.
I'm Jacob Hevenor. 2020 has been a year of a lot of changes, and that has been very true for myself as well. Um, when I look back on this year, I am so far away in so many ways, like physically for one, but also um, spiritually um, from where I thought I would be when the year started. I started off the year beginning a new job working for the Salvation Army at the territorial headquarters in Mexico, living and working in Mexico City. I was working on the projects department where if you've ever put some change into the World Services bin uh, or bucket at, at church, that's where the money was going to the projects that we were implementing in Mexico working on a lot of children's homes, working on a lot of um, upkeep of the centers throughout the country, but also developing future programs for migrants because that's a, um, a big issue in the country of Mexico, especially up around the northern border with the United States. Unfortunately, we were just starting to make some progress. I was just getting comfortable. I was really getting into the groove of things and really we were starting to see an impact when the pandemic arrived. I was forced out of the country back here to Massachusetts. Um, that doesn't mean that the work stopped, of course. Um, if anything, it picked up. In Mexico, they're working so hard now um, fighting against the pandemic while also managing the migrant crisis and so many things at the same time and definitely keep them in your prayers as they continue to work through all of those things. I had to return home and start fresh and I had to look for what God was going to do with me when I had thought that I had something new set up and ready to go. I had to reassess. Um, it wasn't that he had led me down the wrong path, I would say, but definitely um, what I had done wasn't where I was supposed to be at the time. For whatever reason, um, what I had done I felt was good, but it was time to look for something new. I took the skills that I had developed down there, and I can now say that I'm happy, happy to be doing what I'm doing now, which is working um, to help foster kids in the state of Massachusetts get immigration status, most of them having traveled up through Mexico from Central America, where you can see the parallels and see how what I've done in the past is applying to what it's doing. And I really see how God is using me every day where kids that thought they had no future here, kids that didn't know if they were going to have to go back to a place that, that is completely foreign to them, are now seeing how um, there can be a path to them, that there's a, there's a future for them, there's opportunities for them. And that is so rewarding every single day, how I can help kids see that next step, see that there's not just darkness ahead. Um, and as I said, it's, I've come so far this year and in so many ways that I didn't expect. And God has been showing me through it all that even when things seem like they've come crashing down and it seems like what you thought um, wasn't what you hoped it would be, that there's something bright and exciting just around the corner and that God has something planned for you, even if it's outside your wildest dreams. So um, that's what I've been thinking on and reflecting on this year and just really thanking God for all that he's done. And I look forward to see what he's doing in the future in my life. Each week in our online worship, we have a set aside time of intentional prayer to call upon the name of the Lord. This morning, as we stand right in between the old and the new, we remind ourselves of just how much we need the presence and the guidance of God as we face the future. Let's pray together. Lord, in the midst of such uncertainty over the days ahead, would you remind us of your unchanging love? In the midst of such heartache, would you draw ever so near with the presence of your comfort? Father, might you renew within each of us the commitment that is ours to be hearers and doers of your word. We pray this morning for a, a filling of hope over us, that you are going to do a new thing in us and in your church in this new year. Lord, we thank you for loving sinners like us, and we thank you for calling us your own. Father, we trust in you for all that lies ahead for all that we do not see, and we pray that your presence might continue to accompany us into this new year. We pray these things in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Hi, I'm Luke. I'm Peyton. I'm Sydney. And I'm Annie. And this morning, as we celebrate the last Sunday of 2020, we're going to be talking about what it means to be people of expectation. What is expectation? It means to be an expert. I would know. I'm basically an expert at everything. <laughs> um, hey, expert, that's not what it means. Expectation means waiting with hope or to be looking forward to something. 
We just celebrated Christmas, and that's one of the greatest times of expectation that we celebrate as Christians. Oh, so you mean like how Mary was pregnant and expecting a baby Jesus? Yeah, kind of. Every day that we drew closer and closer to Christmas, feelings of hope and joy just overflow. And now, like the child who is awaiting Christmas Day, the mother awaiting the birth of her child in a stable, like the world awaiting a savior, there are so many people in our world expectantly waiting for change. Wait, I have the perfect idea for a game that will help us understand the joy and excitement of expectation. Out of all the eggs in front of us, only one of them is raw, and the only way to find out which one is raw is to start cracking. We're Team Sydney. Sydney and Emerson, and we're here for the win. And we're Team Layton. <laughs> hey. God says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for peace, not evil. Plans to give you a future and hope. Never forget that. Since we are children of God, we wait with hope because God already knows what the future holds. Having hope means to look forward to something with feelings of expectation or confidence. Since we are God's children, we always have hope because we have God living within us. The word hope in the Bible expresses confidence and assurance about the future because it's based on God's promises, God's character, and His faithfulness. All this talk of hope reminds me of one of my favorite stories in the Bible. There was this guy and his name was Daniel. And one day King Darius made a decree and he said, Anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days except for his majesty, King Darius, will be thrown into the lion's den. When Daniel heard this, he said, nope, not going to happen. He went home, got on his knees, and prayed to God, just as he has always done. Some really jealous men who were advisors to the king learned that Daniel was already disregarding the decree. They went straight to the king to tell him just what Daniel was doing. They insisted that he face the consequence and be thrown into the lion's den. And that's what he did. The men had Daniel brought to the king, and the king had Daniel thrown into the lion's den. Then the king said, May your God you serve continually rescue you. The stone was rolled over the den, and the night came. The king was so anxious over the whole thing, he couldn't eat and he couldn't sleep. The next morning the king rushed to the den. And when he got there, he shouted, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve been able to rescue you from the lions? And Daniel shouted back, God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent before God and also before you. How amazing is God? This story gives us hope. If Daniel could walk into the lion's den with all of the odds stacked against him and still come out victorious, we can walk into his new year full of hope over what God is going to do. The world will tell us to put our hope and confidence in ourselves and those around us, but God tells us to place our hope in Him. When our hope is in Him, we will find the strength we need to face any challenge that will come our way. None of us could have expected to face the things that came our way last year, just like the king never expected Daniel to be alive after sleeping in the lion's den, and like how none of us could have expected which egg would be the raw one. But because of Jesus, we have hope for what comes next. We don't need to be anxious or worried. We can rest on the truth of God's word and find peace in his unfailing love for us. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Isaiah 43, 15 through 19, the New Living Translation. I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's creator and king. I am the Lord who opened a way through the waters, making a dry path through the sea. 
I called forth the mighty army of Egypt with all its chariots and horses. I drew them beneath the waves, and they drowned. Their lives snuffed out like a smoldering candle wick. But forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I am going to do, for I am about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wastelands. Well, friends, here we are. It's the final Sunday of 2020, and what a year it has been. We know that for so many, this has been a year of challenge, heartache, grief, and loss. Over the last 10 months, we've embraced new normals. We've stumbled upon new rhythms and routines for life as we know it. We've learned how to work in our sweatpants, how to keep six feet of distance between ourselves and others at all times, and if I'm being truly honest, I'm still trying to figure out how to wear a mask without fogging up my glasses. Is it possible? I don't know. I've given up. Well, when everything is said and done, what narrative will history write about the year 2020? Will it be remembered as a year of sickness, tragedy, unrest, political upheaval? Will there be space set aside to reflect on the good things that have taken place? The weddings, the births, graduations, new careers, new life transitions. What about the important lessons that we've learned? The ways that we've grown, the relationships that have been deepened, and the connections that have mattered the most. However your version of 2020 is remembered, never forget that our circumstances are constantly changing. 
And so does the way that we feel about our situation and our circumstance at any given moment. But we can thank God that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. When life is tragic and grief-stricken, he is always good. When our faith is erratic and unsteady, he is always faithful. As you reflect on everything that's transpired this past year, I pray that you will make space for hope to reside because our confidence rests upon a sovereign God who is never caught off guard, who is never left unprepared. As eager as we might be to, to finally turn the page on 2020, know that even these days have been accounted for. Even these days are a part of God's divine plan. There is purpose in the process. And so today, as we come to the end of another year, we lean in just a bit closer, asking for the Lord to sharpen our focus, to give us eyes to see what waits on the horizon. Here in this moment, we ask for a fresh rejuvenation of our weary hearts and restless souls so that we can step into tomorrow with confidence and hope. Friends, what new thing does God intend to do in your life in 2021? How has he used your experience of this past year to equip and prepare you for the days ahead? Well, let's be honest. We all like new things. If we didn't, Apple wouldn't drop a new version of the iPhone every six months. The McRib and the Shamrock Shake would always be on McDonald's menu. And Marvel wouldn't waste time producing yet another terrible Ant-Man movie. Newness naturally generates a sense of excitement and expectation. Think about the joy, the anticipation surrounding the birth of a newborn baby. What about the adventure of starting a new job or moving to a new town? Think about the butterflies of a new relationship. Scripture tells us that creation itself looks forward to newness, to new seasons of life. In Romans chapter 8, verses 19 and 21, Paul writes, Creation waits with eager longing in hope that it will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We live our lives with expectation. And it's this desire for something new, something fresh, something better than the status quo that inspires us to dream and dares us to hope for what might be possible in the days ahead. But the truth is, if we don't have the eyes to see the new thing that God is doing in these days, then we'll miss opportunities for our faith to be strengthened by his power and goodness. We'll miss out on opportunities for gratitude to flow out of our worship we will fail to give God the praise that he deserves for what he's already done and what he intends to do. And so with this in mind, we can begin to understand why Isaiah says in verse 18 of chapter 43, do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. Strangely enough, we know from Israel's experience that every time they forgot their history, terrible things happened as a result. Because they failed to look back and remember who they belonged to and what God had accomplished on their behalf, they were led astray time after time after time. In Israel's rebellion, they compromised God's favor. They compromised their blessing. They forfeited covenant relationship for the cheap substitute of idolatry. And so it's only fitting that this is where we find Isaiah speaking to a group of discouraged Jewish refugees who had spent the last 70 years of their lives in exile. They knew that it would be a long journey back home, and they understood the grueling task that waited for them once they got there. Yet Isaiah dared to hope in the new thing that God had orchestrated for his people. We know that the past can teach us some valuable life lessons. But while the past certainly plays a role in shaping both our present and our future, we also know as believers that our past does not define us. Amen? Amen. Our past should never be permitted to hold us captive. However, one of the common problems that we run into when looking back at our past is that we don't always do so with complete honesty and openness. 
how easy it can be to manufacture a sanitized version of our story. Intentionally avoiding the traumas, the failures, the struggles, and the shames that God has reclaimed and repurposed for his glory. You see, if we aren't careful, we can easily become a prisoner of the moment. So fixated and so consumed by our present situation that we exhaust all our emotional energy looking for what once was. If only somehow we could get back to those good old days when everything just seemed right. Oh, how easy these romanticized versions of the past neglect to tell the real story of the challenges and the struggles that were also very real and very present in that particular time and place. It's impossible to move ahead when we're stuck looking in the rearview mirror. You see, the past can be a rudder to guide you, but it should never become an anchor to drag you. We learn from the past, but we do not live in the past. We all remember Israel's grumbling in the wilderness, right? If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt. There we sat around with pots filled with meat and ate all the bread that we wanted. But now you, Moses, you've brought us out into this wilderness to starve. If only, if only, if only. How often have our if onlys prevented us from reaching out for the new thing that God has ready and waiting for us? This is why Isaiah warns the people not to be held hostage by the past, to not give in to the temptation to give power and authority to the masters of fear and doubt. Isaiah knew that if God's people were to do this, they would become paralyzed, unable to move forward in hope of God's provision. In the mid-20th century, there was a notorious newspaper editor by the name of Henry L. Mencken. Mencken was known for his pessimistic outlook on life. He was also known for his relentless criticism of religion, faith, and the belief in an almighty God. Mencken once claimed that hope was nothing more than a pathological delusion in the occurrence of the impossible. You see, Mencken believed that it was a total waste of time for people to chase after what he considered foolish ambitions and empty expectations. Mencken thought, why dare to hope when life is destined to disappoint? Man, what a miserable perspective. Yet the reality is that for so many today, hope is virtually non-existent. A smoldering ember extinguished by the harsh realities of a cold, dark world. Hopelessness is amplified every time we witness another senseless act of hatred, violence, greed, and brutality that dehumanizes and degrades the image of God in our neighbor. The murmurings of sin and death remind us just how weak and powerless we can be. We know this to be true every time that we come crawling back to the same destructive pleasures, the same numbing addictions, the same patterns of abuse and dysfunction, the self-sabotage, and the relapse. In a year such as this, many of us have become profoundly aware of the limits of our emotional and spiritual capacities. 2020 has revealed a lot about the way that we process grief, the conditions for gratitude, and how much or how little worship is a priority in our lives. The truth is, challenging times expose things about ourselves that we would never discover when our hearts are at ease. Challenges reveal what we value, whom we trust, and how strong our foundation really is. Suffering has the potential to do one of two things. It can either deepen our dependency on God's purpose and power, or it can harden our hearts and our minds in a posture of rebellion, hardening our hearts to the point of hostility to God's will and his way. You see, God made Israel sit in their suffering, but he didn't leave them in their suffering. Seventy years of exile were needed before hope could be realized, before they could see the new thing that God had prepared. As believers, we should never settle for a hopeless existence. We must never view our momentary troubles as any match for the power of an omnipotent and eternal God. God is for you. He always has been and he always will be. But this doesn't mean that the evil one won't try to throw spears in your direction. Navigating this world will always be a challenge for those whose faith is centered on the cross. 
In John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus cautions his disciples by saying, in this world you will face trials of many kinds. Jesus doesn't say, you might have some bad days, you might have some bad weeks, some months, or even a bad year. No, Jesus guarantees that you will. But in the very next breath, Jesus delivers the promise that restores hope. Take courage, for I have overcome the world. In our flesh, we tend to view God through the lens of our circumstances. We cry out, how could a perfectly good God allow such pain and suffering and brokenness to exist? But a heart of trust and expectant hope enables us to view our circumstances through the reality of an almighty God. Through Israel's new exodus in Isaiah chapter 43, we are reminded that God always makes a way, even when we don't yet see it or comprehend it. Just like God led his people out of Egypt and through the Red Sea, he would also lead them out of Babylon and through the desolate wilderness that lay in between. Just as the Lord had defeated Pharaoh's army, he would also snuff out Israel's enemies like a smoldering candle wick. The new thing that God did for Israel provided a glimpse of what Christ would later come to fulfill. God speaks over Israel, I am making a way for you in the desert. Jesus says to you and to me, I am the way, the truth, and the life. God says, I am making streams in the wasteland. Jesus promises, whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst. Newness is all about transformation. Rivers cannot run through deserts without fundamentally changing them. Likewise, God's love cannot flow through our hearts without radically transforming us. Before we can fully embrace his new thing, we must be willing to relinquish and let go of the old. Watching God bring life and restoration out of death and destruction is the centerpiece of Christian worship. This is the good news, the hope of the gospel. This is our story. And so today, as we eagerly look beyond 2020 to the new thing that God is springing up all around us, consider this. The church has never been so attentive to those who can't leave their home as they are right now. And to think there have always been homebound individuals within our sphere of influence. The church has never been so creative in supporting those who have lost jobs or have had their wages cut. And yet people in our communities have always carried burdens of financial hardship. The church has never been so accessible to people who don't know Christ and most likely would never step foot in a physical church building. There's an entirely new demographic of unchurched people who are more inclined to hear the gospel preached over YouTube or Facebook out of curiosity. And yet, there have always been people in our neighborhoods, our communities, and perhaps even our own families who are always eager to listen, but not yet comfortable enough to enter our space. There are many examples, but the point is this. The new thing that God is doing should tune our ears and recalibrate our hearts to his voice in ways that we might never have considered or pursued on our own out of fear, discomfort, or complacency. If we don't allow God's new thing to create and establish our new normal, and we simply revert back to business as usual, then the train of God's mission will have left and we'll be standing there all alone on the platform. There once was a property owner who was selling an old warehouse that had been vacant for years and was in dire need of repair. You see, vandals had broken the doors from the hinges, they had shattered the windows, they had dumped trash throughout the interior. And so every time that the property owner showed the property off to a potential buyer, he was embarrassed, he was ashamed, he was humiliated by the sheer amount of work that would be needed to restore the warehouse back to its former glory. Obviously, the windows would need to be replaced, a professional crew would be required to correct any structural damage, and a deep cleaning would certainly be in order to sanitize the areas where trash had accumulated and rotted. One day, the property owner received an unexpected email from a potential buyer whom he had walked through the warehouse just a few days earlier. No repairs will be necessary, the buyer wrote. When I purchased this place, I plan to build something completely different. 
To be honest, I never wanted the building in the first place. I just want the land upon which the warehouse has been built. I love that story because it reminds us that God makes all things new. All he desires from us is access and permission to build again upon the ruins of what once stood. Friends, hopelessness blurs our vision. Hopelessness prevents us from seeing God for who he is and what he is up to. But God specializes in doing a brand new thing. He is the author of newness because redemption and healing are in his nature. As the author and finisher of our faith, Christ always has the last word. He gets the final say. He is the one who has conquered sin and death. He is the king who is high and lifted up above every kingdom and power that this world has ever known. And it is he who will one day come again to make all things new. This is a promise that meets us in our fear and replaces it with hope. May this same hope sustain you today into 2021 and beyond. He is doing a new thing. Do you have eyes to see? Thank you for joining us this morning. We also want to remind you that you still have the opportunity to participate in the ministry of giving through your tithes and offering. You can mail your tithe directly to your local core, use your local bank's bill pay feature, or use the app Tithely. Our Eastern Territory is now using this app as a means to process your tithe electronically. You can download it from the App Store and follow the prompts to set up your account. From there, you can choose your payment option along with the core that you would like to receive your offering. For more information on how to use Tithely, please contact your core officer. And now, please receive our benediction from Ephesians 3. In union with Christ and through our faith in him, we have the boldness to go into God's presence with all confidence. To him, by means of his power, working in us is able to do so much more than we can ever ask for or even think of. To God be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus for all time, forever and ever. Amen.